So uh, in terms of its impact on biodiversity, we're looking at uh, the impacts at several levels. So one is the effects potentially on species extinction. Uh, one is on where species might move to as uh, climate warms. And others are about how whole biomes could ch change. So whole habitats could completely change from forest to grassland or things like that. Um, all of those suggest that two degrees would already uh, create very large changes. So uh, species we know are already starting to move away from the equator and towards poles, and if we get to two degrees, those movements could be on the order of hundreds of kilometers towards the, the poles. Um, there's been a lot published on extinctions. Uh, while there's a large uncertainty around how much uh, warming would cause in terms of extinctions, uh, it certainly would greatly increase them uh, over the next coming decade. Next coming decades. Uh, more scary is if we get up to four, five, six degrees, which is if we continue the way we are right now with our greenhouse gas emissions, we could easily be in that range of temperatures. And that's when you really start to see whole ecosystems collapse, forests turning into to, to, to prairies, uh, Arctic tundra being taken over by boreal forest, things like that. So uh, uh, at two degrees, you'd have major changes that would have big impacts on us, uh, society. Uh, at four, five, six degrees, you're talking about huge changes in the, in the earth. Forests have been a, quite a big topic over the past couple of years. I've noticed there's been more and more coverage on the impact um, that temperature rises could have on particularly the Amazon rainforest. What, what are your kind of scenarios um, for that part of the world? Well, there's uh, a fair amount of work now that's been done on the, the Amazon forest, for example, but on forests uh, globally. Um, and they tend to indicate this same kind of thing, that if you go up to about roughly two degrees or so, what you'll see are trees moving uh, towards the, the poles and away from the equator. So dying towards the southern end of their distribution in the northern hemisphere and starting to move up into uh, more northern climates. Uh, and that you can see already, there's a number of studies that have been published that have shown that trees very slowly are starting to march northward in the northern hemisphere. What we're really worried about is uh, that that could lead to really major shifts. And one of the best examples is what might happen in the Amazon forest. Um, and there's some indications that with both deforestation uh, and climate change, the two coupled together uh, could lead to a, a collapse of large areas of the Amazon forest and its replacement by either highly degraded forest, which would burn fairly easily, uh, or by uh, scrub. Uh, and if that happened, it would actually be very difficult to come back to having rainforest in those areas and it would have really negative consequences. So you would actually then reduce rainfall over the whole Amazon basin and probably over even very much larger areas of the, of the Earth. And there's even some evidence that the deforestation in the Amazon has already reduced rainfall over large areas of, of South America and perhaps even as far north as uh, southern parts of the United States. How, I mean, this. I, I, have, uh, I have no knowledge of how long this planet has been working for, but I'm sure um, there'd be many experts to be able to tell us the millions and billions of years the planet Earth has been here. But over that time, I imagine the Earth's you know, flora and fauna have adapted. Is there, is there no way that trees, plants, animals will adapt to these change in temperatures, or is this over too short a period of time? I think there's a lot of... Um, uh, uncertainty around that and you'll find a lot of probably different views in the scientific community about that. Some people tend to be fairly optimistic because indeed uh, plants and animals have done a, a great job of adapting. So um, as we came out of the last glacial cycle and into this relatively warm period that we're currently in, there were almost no extinctions of plant species that we know of. Um, and that suggests that they, they can adapt. Um, but at the same time, what we know is that they moved a lot. They moved hundreds, and some of them thousands of kilometers when, when that, that, that happened. And we're talking potentially about the same kinds of temperature changes over the next century. Uh, at the minimum, there's a consensus in the entire scientific community that that's going to mean they're going to move hundreds, 
of kilometers, many hundreds of kilometers, if we see those temperature changes. Uh, the impacts on biodiversity then will be tremendous. The, con the question is, what will the consequences for us be? And you just have to think about whole ecosystems moving hundreds of kilometers, and that's clearly going to have some impacts on our our well-being, on our economy. We're going to have to completely adapt our forestry practices to completely different climates, probably different uh, species of trees. And, um, those are really going to pose some really big problems for, for our society. And I think most people don't imagine how big those changes are likely to be for us. There's people often say in the climate change debate that because you can't really see the change, it doesn't really resonate with the public. But from what you're saying, you know, when these happen, people will see those changes and they'll, they'll see them, you know, they'll hit them slap bang in the face. I mean, is this, is this perhaps another way that you can, people can sell to politicians, you know, the idea that you need to take action on this now? Is this another avenue that perhaps people need to explore? I think that the changes that you can see are, are, are a good way to, to talk to people about uh, climate change. And one of the things that people can see is that uh, some species are actually beginning to move towards the, the poles. Um, we, need, uh, we know that a lot of butterflies, for example, are starting to move towards the poles. Uh, we know that many trees, and people can actually observe this, many trees, many crops are starting to flower earlier in the, in the season and drop their leaves for trees later in the season. Uh, for wine grapes, we're now seeing them being harvested earlier and earlier because the season's much warmer and so they ripen quicker. So people can actually begin to see these changes around them. And then what we can do is help them think about what those might mean if they keep going in that direction. And yes, I think talking about those things that people can already start to see and then telling them if that continues on, that might be the consequences, I think, can be a good and an effective way of communicating about climate change and biodiversity. And, and on a kind of final point, a very effective um, graphic you showed um, demonstrated the potential changes that we're seeing, perhaps the changes we're seeing now, so not potential, in um, fish stocks around the world. Um, how, how serious do you think that, that could be? What are the, what are the sort of worst case, worst case scenarios? Well, the, the worst case scenarios you don't really want to get into because they're so bad, but um, if you got five, six degree temperature change plus the ocean acidification that goes with that because the, when the CO2 rises in the atmosphere it tends to acidify the ocean, and if you couple that with the, the current trend in overfishing, basically what you get to is an ocean that's dominated by algae and jellyfish. And there's actually places where we're already starting to see that. So as waters get a little warmer and as you tend to overfish, you tend to simplify the ecosystem. And we could wind up eating jellyfish instead of fish over the next several decades. Um, I suppose that's kind of the worst possible case. And, and there's a lot of reasons to believe that that might not happen because of the adaptive capacity of of ecosystems because we might be intelligent and stop overfishing or reduce our overfishing. And so I think there also has to be a positive message that if we can maintain uh, global climate change to a relatively small level, if we can reduce the other pressures on these systems, marine systems, by reducing the, the fishing pressure on them, most scenarios actually suggest that we can get to a world that's different than, than we're in now, but not radically different. And, and I think that's one of the most important messages to get across, is that there will be changes. Uh, most of us who work on looking into the future are pretty sure that there will be fairly important changes, but some of those remain more or less in our comfort zone. But if we don't do anything, don't do anything about over-exploitation of resources, don't do anything about climate change, they're going to be way outside our comfort zone. One final point. The scenarios that you have talked about and you showed were all, um, they, they all appeared alarming. What, what has gone wrong um, when it comes to communicating these scenarios to, quite frankly, the people who matter, who aren't really me, they're, they're, they're the politicians and the policy makers in countries around the world? What's, 
What's gone wrong? Well, one of the problems is, and the climate change community has clearly showed this, they have an extremely good capacity to develop scenarios for the future. And I think uh, outside of the climate deniers, there's a large uh, body of people, both politicians, uh, the public, uh, the large scientific community that believes that we're headed towards uh, significant climate change. And the problem is that is not with getting across the message. I, a lot of people believe that climate change is going to happen. It's about the action that you need to take to, to resolve the issues. And I think we're, to a certain extent, in the same stage with looking at the impacts on biodiversity. So we've got a lot more work to do, perhaps even more so than the climate scientists, first of all, convince decision makers that there really is a problem. But I think we've begun to do a fairly good job with that. Um, what we need to show them now is that if they took strong action now, it actually could be beneficial, so that the, it actually makes sense to do something now. And perhaps one of the most important things is, at least for some decision makers, is to show them how that's going to impact people. So uh, especially uh, in their livelihoods, in their health, um, show the, how it's going to impact national economies. And so there's a real movement also to, to go beyond just showing that it plants and animals and fish are going to move around, but to show them exactly what that impact is going to be for the, their constituents, for if you're a policymaker, uh, if, they're, if you're the public, what that's going to mean for, for you. Um, I think there's a real need, and I think the scientific community understands that need to, to really move into showing people what the, the impacts are going to be for them.